today is take you to a House hearing. We have live coverage this morning from the Rayburn House office building on Capitol Hill. On your left, Mr. Pruitt, Kenneth Pruitt, the Census Bureau Director, and on the right side of the screen, Congressman Dan Miller, Republican from Florida, who chairs the House Government Reform Subcommittee on the Census. They've been meeting uh, like this uh, every month to get an update on the year 2000 Census and all the related issues involved. So we have live coverage of the hearing, expected to begin in a moment and uh, run a couple of hours live here on C-SPAN. Good morning. Welcome to a, the uh, May hearing with uh, Director Pruitt on the status of the decennial census. We'll uh, begin with opening statements um, and then we'll have a chance for Ms. Maloney and myself to ask some questions of Director Pruitt. Thank you, Director Pruitt, for once again being here. Since we met last, 
the Census Bureau has reported on the final numbers for the male response rates. The final male response of 65%, which may inch even higher, will be at least four percentage points above what the Bureau had budgeted for. As you have said, Director Pruitt, this was no small achievement. The male response rate had been in steady decline since 1970. In the absence of significant improvements, the male response rate would have been expected to be in the neighborhood of 55 percent this time. The Census Bureau is to be commended for halting the slide in civic participation in the mail-out, mail-back phase of the Census. I firmly believe that the combination of community partnerships, paid advertising, and a strong commitment to the Census by Congress which in the end will have appropriated almost $6.8 billion, have all contributed to the better than expected male response rate. A story in New yesterday's New York Times reported that all signs seem to indicate that the outreach, advertising, and partnership programs have succeeded in raising the response rates for those missed in the 1990 census, or at least prevented them from declining. This is significant, since Republicans have maintained that if, a, if we funded the proper outreach and promotion programs, we could reach the undercounted. I'm gratified to see we were right. I am, though, still disappointed that three significant programs were not included in this census. A second mailing, which easily could have boosted response rates in the 70s based on the results of the dress rehearsal. Second, the use of administrative records. And third, the ability of local governments to check the Census Bureau's work. In fact, on the issue of the post-census local review, a local government in the Tampa area has already decided to sue the Census Bureau. Director Pruitt, in a letter dated April 14, I ask that you reprogram the budgetary savings from the increased male response rate to reach those groups that are traditionally undercounted. In that letter, I estimated the savings to be about $34 million for every percentage point above 61. This estimate was based upon a report issued by the General Accounting Office in December of 1999. I also explained that I would be of any assistance should you need it in gaining approval from Congress to transfer money between frameworks. To date, my help has not been solicited. And in, a and in a written response to me, you also noted that although you believe there would be budgetary savings, you believe that the GAO estimate may not be accurate because you may have a lower than expected productivity rate driving that number somewhat lower. Fair enough. I just want to be very clear on one point. This chairman and this Congress is expect you to use all the tools in your toolbox to reach the undercounted. This windfall in your budget is expected to be used directly to reach those not counted during the mail response phase of the census and those traditionally undercounted. This opportunity must not go to waste. It will not be acceptable to miss our objectives and have funding to spare. More advertising, more outreach, higher pay rates, special enumeration techniques are just some of the items the Bureau must consider to help elim eliminate the differential undercount during the most difficult part of the full enumeration, non-response follow-up. And speaking of non-response follow-up, I was delighted that the House leadership devoted part of the radio address on April 22nd, delivered by Congressman Tom Davis, a member of this committee, um, saying in part, quote, Next week, hundreds of thousands of enumerators will fan out across America to find those not already counted. These enumerators are your neighbors and friends, co-workers and family. When an enumerator comes to your door, please cooperate by giving them a few minutes of your time and answering their questions. By law, your answers are kept strictly confidential. Your census answers are important to allocate seats in Congress and to help government officials determine where to build roads, daycare facilities, and schools in the coming weeks, if you should encounter a census worker, please thank them for their effort and dedication to the 2000 census." End quote. I want to personally thank Congressman Davis for delivering this important message. Dir Director Pruitt, there still remains a great deal of debate surrounding the long form. This subcommittee has been trying to get a handle on just what is fueling this debate. Is there a legitimate feeling out in the public that the long form questions are intrusive? Or, as some have charged, is this debate being fueled by a few elected officials who have expressed concerns for the constituents' privacy worries. Dr. Pruitt, when you came before this committee, subcommittee a month ago, and in numerous public events since, you cited a poll by InterSurvey. You have claimed that people's uneasiness about the long form jumped the week congressional leaders made their remarks. What you neglected to say was, that, in fact, that the bump in concerns coincided with the arrival of the census questionnaires in people's homes 
and not clearly linked to comments by Mr. Lott or Mr. Bush. When we went back and looked at the polling data, it shows that the rate of concern had actually reached 18% by March 26, before comments by Senator Lott and Governor Bush were widely reported in the press. The reason why the previous survey showed a lower level of concerns was because the forms had yet to be mailed. What's more, the very next week after what were supposedly alarming remarks, the concern rate over the long form fell two percentage points. I'm very disappointed that you were not more forthright regarding the poll, which is being conducted in conjunction with the Census Bureau. Since the 18th of April, you have known internally that your worries about the long form have been, quote, resolved, end quote, and that long form and short form return rates have exceeded your expectations. And yet you have continued to publicly express concerns about the long form and blame Republicans for their comments. You can only conclude that since your public comments do not match your own internal information, it's telling you that you are attempting to politicize the census at this crucial time, period of time. Director Pruitt, let me call to your attention the next chart. And since we, we don't have charts right now because of uh, the computer mix up yesterday, the virus, so we have a handout that, uh, uh, oh, we, uh, for this one. Uh, this is a copy of page five of the eight, April 18 executive state of the census report produced by the, the Census Bureau. It clearly states that the issue regarding the long form response had been resolved. I quote, Result, resolved long form response rate. The difference between the response rate for the long form and the short form has been greater than expected. We were concerned because conducting proportionally more long form interviews affect productivity and non-response follow-up. Resolution. By April 18, both the long form return rate and the short term form return rate had exceeded our goals, unquote. So while internally there was a, quote, resolved, unquote, issue, you have continued to overstate the problem. I have to say I've come to expect this type of disregard and distortion of the truth by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I am very disappointed that as a professional, the head of an agency that prides itself on accuracy and quality data, that you would succumb to these political temptations. At the same time, I realize that you are a political appointee of President Clinton and as such are subject to the influences of this administration. As I've said before, this administration is as much to blame for these increasing privacy concerns as anyone is. From the Pentagon to the White House, this administration has demonstrated time and time again that it only believes in privacy when it's politically expedient. President Clinton and Vice President Gore must be paying attention to the current privacy issues regarding the long form, since they have a new privacy initiative they recently launched. I find this almost laughable considering, considering the breaches of trust this administration has been accustomed to. Let me also say how deeply concerned I am about the accidental faxing of confidential information to a private household that recently occurred in Congressman Coburn's district. For our viewing and listening audience, let me give some of the facts, as reported in the Phoenix newspaper earlier this week. A Census Bureau employee at the regional office accidentally dialed in a wrong fax number and faxed information on Census Bureau applicants to a private household instead of another census office. This information included names, addresses, test scores, and social security numbers, and is protected by the Privacy Act. The fax was, fax was then given to Congressman Coburn and that is how this serious breach of security, even if accidental, came to light. I have been a staunch defender of the Bureau's commitment to privacy, but frankly, that confidence has been shaken. You cannot placate members of Congress and the American people who have expressed concerns about privacy and confidentiality on one hand, then allow this kind of thing to happen on the other. I certainly can't assure people with the same level of confidence I had a week ago about the Bureau's ability to protect their privacy. Director Pruitt, the Founding Fathers were very wise. I now know that the real reason we only conduct a census every 10 years is because no one could possibly go through this process yearly, whether on your side or mine. This has truly been an arduous task. However, it is honestly made more difficult when we see a pattern of behavior that leads it, lends itself to partisan politics. You made a commitment to be nonpartisan, and I will hold you to it. Ms. Maloney. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and it's, uh, I look forward to your comments, uh, D Director Pruitt. On, on April 27th, the most critical and labor-intensive phase of the Census 2000 began as census takers fanned out across America to visit those households which did not mail back their questionnaires. 
These next 10 weeks will undoubtedly be the most difficult faced by the Census Bureau for the Census 2000. I urge all Americans to cooperate and to cooperate with the census takers. I urge them to fill out their forms and give them to the census takers. They, the census takers are people from your own communities who have undergone a security background check and they will be easily identifiable from their badges, from their tote bags. Each one carries the number of their local census department. For the most part, these workers are your neighbors and friends hired from the local community because they know its streets and neighborhoods, speak its languages, and are familiar with its culture. Your cooperation is vital to the success of the 2000 Census. Your answers are strictly confidential. No other government agency, public or private, no individual will see your answers. Not the IRS, the FBI, INS, the CIA, the president himself, no one can have access to your answers. Please cooperate if an enumerator knocks on your door. When you look back only a few months ago, the two biggest unanswered questions that had the potential to threaten the success of the census were, first, what would the male res response rate be? And would we be able to hire enough qualified workers to do non-response follow-up in the midst of this incredible, successful economy with such low unemployment rates? Well, we now have the answers to both of these questions. First, the Census Bureau, through its remarkable advertising campaign and community outreach, has achieved a 66% male response rate for the 2000 Census an outstanding achievement, which has reversed the decades-long decline in the participation of the American people in the census. Second, as a result of careful planning, the Bureau has, cre has recruited 108% of its national hiring goal. And I must say, uh, Director, that I have met many of these enumerators while working uh, with, with Chairman uh, Miller on homeless night here in the district and while visiting with enumerators back in my district in, in Queens and, and Manhattan. And I am really uh, very impressed with the quality and commitment of the people that you have recruited. The commitment and energy that they show to the task of counting Americans is inspiring, given what I know is a, a challenging and difficult job of knocking on doors and trying to get people, especially New Yorkers, to, to, to take a minute to respond and to talk to you. I, I would um, like, Mr. Chairman, to place in the record an article from yesterday's Boston Globe written by an enumerator. And I think that this um, article very much captures the spirit and commitment of enumerators across the country. It is called A View from the Front Door, Educates a, a Census Taker, and with your, with your cooperation. It shows really how hard the enumerators are working and how committed they are. These, these accomplishments are, are truly good news, and I must commend uh, Dr. Pruitt, Marvin Raines, John Thompson, and the entire decennial staff and every employee of the Census Bureau, both permanent and, permanent and temporary, for a job well done so far. It appears that the census is on track, Obvi obviously, in, in any uh, operation as large as this, there are going to be problems, problems that I am sure the chairman's uh, questions will bring out in more detail. But to me, it seems that you and the staff have tried to meet these challenges head on, that you've been quick to inform the chairman and the public of the problems, something I don't think many organizations would do in such a quick and complete manner. You have warned us of what you think the, the challenges will be, so while the news nationally is indeed good, it still means that a lot of work needs to be done. Over a third of America's households must still receive a visit from the census taker. That's 42 million doors that need to be knocked on. I look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Pruitt on, on, on how the next aspects of the census is coming and what we can expect, what problems you foresee, what challenges lie ahead. But I, I really uh, want to respond to, to some of the statements that uh, uh, Chairman Miller just met. 
And I, I only want to speak um, uh, for myself. I have never said that statements of Governor Bush, Senator Lott, and Speaker Hastert, along with dozens of, uh, a dozen additional members of Congress, are solely to blame for the privacy issues that have been raised about the census. But I must say, and I, I think the facts are very clear and speak for themselves, that the leadership of the Republican Party in the middle of a national civic ceremony, in a national effort to count every single person in our country, to get vital information about our country so that we can plan and distribute uh, federal dollars fa fairly, they decided in the midst of this campaign to count everyone to go negative. They decided that they would not support this national effort, but would trash it. They didn't show leadership, and they didn't explain that all of this information is completely protected. What they did was pander to talk shows and right-wing fringe groups. What they've done is, and I'd like to put in this record, what they've done in the midst of this is send out fundraising appeals, calling it the Republican census document. I'd like to put this. That's what their effort is in the middle of this national civic ceremony. Now, I, I really believe very strongly that privacy is a tremendously important issue to every person in America. And I feel strongly about privacy. And along with the leadership in the Banking Committee in a bipartisan way, um, Chairman Leach and many Democrats, and I was part of that effort, worked uh, to put forward um, privacy language in the um, Banking Modernization Bill. The President has come forward with even more uh, language on protection of financial information, and he has put that before Congress, and I will be a co-sponsor of it. On another committee that I work on, um, uh, Chairman Burton's committee, there have been uh, many, many hearings on privacy over health records, and in a bipartisan way, working with uh, Chairman Horn, we've had many hearings, put forward legislation, and worked for privacy in a bipartisan way. But the census is protected. The confidentiality is protected. And it is important for planning for our country. And as we have said many, many times, the questions on the census form are exactly the same questions on the long form that President Reagan and President Bush and every member of Congress, they got three years' notice endorsed. It is even shorter than the form that went out uh, in 1990, five questions shorter. The only new question was uh, added in response, as we know, to the welfare reform uh, on a bipartisan way to get a tracking of how many grandparents are taking care of children. So I must say that the timing of the national Republican leadership in the midst of the census, most uh, sensitive time during the mail back response time to basically call the census optional was just plain wrong. May I put in the record the uh, Republican national, it's called the Republican census document. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Well, I must take the chairman's prerogative here to respond briefly to this. I'm very disappointed the, uh, to c say that the Republican leadership trashed the census. That is extreme political rhetoric. It's very disappointing you would try to say that. Trash the census. Miss Maloney. The speaker had a press conference with me a couple weeks ago, encouraged people to respond to it. We took time in the Saturday response. Uh, on the radio response to talk about the census. We provided every penny the bureaus asked for. In fact, I'm, you know, they may have made more money than they needed, but we provided everything they want. And to say they trashed it is wrong. When members of Congress are responding to concerns of constituents, that is what Congress people are supposed to do. And then when we talk about this letter uh, that was sent out, you know, you know, we have invested over $7 billion in census, and I take my role to conduct the census oversight very seriously, and I try not to inject partisan politics in the process. So when the Southeastern Legal Foundation mailing went out, 
I put aside the fact that this group was responsible for a major ruling by the Supreme Court regarding the census. Their mailing did cross the line, and I said so. I didn't stick my head in the sand and blindly defend them. But any objective person looking at an RNC mailing from the Republican National Committee talking about a Republican. Now, unless you want to have a bill to ban everybody from using the word census, but the Census Bureau, then, you know, this is clearly that took the, the Postal Service less than a day or so to say there was no rule breaking. This is a frivolous claim made in an obvious attempt to score political points. And I would like to call my colleagues to join with me in stopping to play politics and we get on with the Census Bureau. Director Pruitt, would you and Mr. Raines? May, may I respond? Well, we're going to have time. Let's, we'll all get a chance to respond. Uh, let's get moving with the opening statements. Director Pruitt, if you would rise, Mr. Thompson and Mr. Raines. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, sir. Let the record know they've answered in the affirmative. And we appreciate that uh, yeah, all of y'all are here again today. Um, and Director Pruitt, I know next week you are about to go, you've been uh, asked to go serve jury duty. And uh, there can't be a more important, I mean, more a busier person in America right now in the middle of the census than the director of the Census Bureau. But as we have all talked about the civic responsibility of the census, it is a civic responsibility to serve our communities on jury duty. So I commend you for willing to step aside from your responsibilities as uh, director so you can serve on the, on the jury. And uh, thank you. Thank you once again for being here. And you have an opening statement. Uh, the official statement will, of course, be entered in the record. And you may proceed. Thank you. And, and just quickly on jury duty, I think that's a tribute to the quality of the staff at the uh, Census Bureau, not to my own commitment. Um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, then read a very quick opening statement and then take an extra minute or two to um, address some of the questions that you raised in your opening statement, if that's permissible. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Maloney, members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here today to provide an update on the status of Census 2000. Last week, as you have both referenced, I had the honor to report the very good news about the state of civic responsibility in our country. The country has stopped a 30-year decline in census cooperation by now, even slightly reversed that decline, and this is indeed a serious achievement. In reaching the 66% mailback response rate, the public outperformed expectations. More than 100,000 census partners deserve credit. Congratulations are owed to thousands of mayors, county commissioners, teachers, community advocates, houses of worship, and other tribal, local government, civic, and business leaders. To Young and Rubicum and our partner agencies for the excellent advertising campaign, and to you, Mr. Chairman, Mrs. Maloney, other members of Congress who've encouraged response to the census. Our partners and the public have treated the census as a serious civic event intended by the founders. The good news about the mail response rate is tempered somewhat by our concerns about long-form non-cooperation and potential loss of data. As I explained at the last hearing, every question we ask in the census serves an important purpose and all have a specific federal, legislative, or judicial mandate or requirement. Very early this year, an advocacy, advocacy group issued a press release that said as follows, real Americans don't answer nosy census questions. You can strike a blow for privacy, equality, and liberty by refusing to answer every question on the census form except the one required by the Constitution, how many people live in your home. This is a misreading of the Constitution, which states that the census is to be conducted in such manner as Congress shall by law direct. The mistaken reading of the Constitution ignores the fact that the nation's founders and its first Congress directed that the census be a tabulation of the population by such characteristics as age, gender, race, and household composition. Every census has been more than a simple head count. Moreover, the misguided advice on how to respond to the census is a prescription not only for poor data quality, but for an increased undercount. If people do not cooperate with the census at all, or just give us a number of persons in the household, whether when they return the form by mail or when the enumerator visits, that will not be sufficient. Beyond the number of people at an address, we require some minimal characteristics to complete an enumeration. Otherwise, we have no way to know if we're dealing with real people. In cases where no cooperation is forthcoming, we will have to compensate by attempting to get the data through interviews with other knowledgeable in individuals. We're also concerned about potential loss of data due to opposition to the long form. There was approximately a 12 percentage point difference between the mail response rates for the long form and short form, double the 1990 rate. We do not have data at this point about item non-response rates. 
That is, for example, how many people who mail back the form did not answer specific questions, such as un income, disability, education, and so forth. Comments we have received give us reason to be concerned about the long form problem. Let me cite just two of these comments. Quote, I have this day read my long form and properly, promptly ripped it in two and burned same. Don't bother sending another as I won't fill it out, nor will I pay the $100 fine. Secondly, I am refusing to complete the long form. You can arrest me if you want, but I'm not going to complete it. Obviously, this is a very small sample from very large, large numbers. It's not intended to be a sample. It's intended to be illustrative. We are very concerned that refusal to respond fully to the Census can pose a serious risk to Census 2000 data. As I previously testified, the Census Bureau would have to determine whether the data are sufficiently reliable to perform the functions expected of them. Let me then very quickly turn to an operational update. In each of the subcommittee hearings that have tracked Census operations over the last few months, I have identified problems that could put the Census at risk in the period that follows the hearing. Thus, in the last hearing, I listed as potential problems the failure to complete the update leave operation, problems with our payroll system, uh, widespread problems filling enumerator positions, problems with Census 2000 address file, uh, breakdown in our telephone questionnaire assistance operation, breakdown in data capture, questionnaire delivery, our unexpectedly low mail response rates, or any event that could undermine faith in the confidentiality of the data, confidentiality of the data such as a hacker on our Internet site. None of those potential problems has occurred. In fact, census operations to date have thus far been quite successful. Every major census operation scheduled for completion is either now complete or in its final stages. This includes update leave, remote Alaska, update enumerate, service-based enumeration, military enumeration, foreign language questionnaires, and others. And I can provide details if you wish. Now we, of course, enter the non-response follow-up operation, which is the largest, most complex, and most costly operation in census 2000. Non-response follow-up raises its own set of potential risk, and I take this hearing as an opportunity to put those on the record. These would include high turnover rates for enumerators, more outright resistance from respondents that could adversely affect either productivity or data quality, a breakdown in our payroll system, or random events, random events such as attacks on enumerators or natural disasters. Turnover has been very low in early census operations, such as update leave, but non-response follow-up is a more difficult and frustrating operation. The controversy over the long form, as I have said, gives us some reason to be concerned about resistance and data quality. Our payroll system has worked very well so far, but non-response follow-up is such a big operation that will be, it will be a major test for that system. So far, we face potential risks during non-response follow-up that could affect accuracy, data quality, or budget. Um, I want to emphasize that the Census Bureau will fully apply its procedures to account for every address that is on our list to be visited during non-response follow-up. These procedures are extensive, include making up to six attempts, three by personal visit and three by phone when a phone number is available to complete the enumeration of a household. These procedures also include extensive quality assurance procedures and supervisory controls. But they also reflect our experience that the longer we are in the field and the further we get from census data, since this day, the more the quality of respondents' answers deteriorates. It is important to keep in mind that we're using a part-time, temporary staff to which we have been able to provide only basic training and survey methods. Extending non-response follow-up beyond the already extensive level of effort we plan would not only increase census cost, it could lead to a reduction in data quality. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, we do appreciate your letter with respect to uh, uh, directing the, the, um, uh, the resources, obviously, to the hard to enumerate areas, and that's what we are exactly doing. I have not directly responded to you, uh, ask your help on a framework uh, reprogramming, because we're within the same framework. It's simply not a framework issue at this stage. But certainly we are putting the monies uh, in those areas. We have raised, um, in now about 10 percent of our LCOs, we have raised um, enumerator um, pay rates, including Tampa, I might say. Um, the preparation for and launching of non-response follow-up was very time-sensitive. It had to be completed in a few days so that we could begin training on time. While it was going on, we continued to ma receive mail responses. Some of those made it into our late mail return files, but some did not. Some people have mailed back their form. Some who have mailed back their form will be visited during non-response follow-up. We realize this will irritate some members of the public who will wonder why we are bothering them again. 
All we can do is explain why this is largely unavoidable given the magnitude of preparing for non-response follow-up. There had to be a cutoff date to begin preparing the assignments and to get all the maps and kits to the right training sites. We do the best we can to strike the late forms that come in for the non-response follow-up universe, but clearly cannot do so for all late returns. Forms are still coming in as we speak. We've also received many forms, such as be-counted forms, that do not have identification codes. These require a labor-intensive matching and place coding operation to code them to the right geographic area. So this sometimes correct complaint that I've already sent the form in is something our enumerators are trained to deal with. Of course, they will try to complete an enumeration of these housing units because many people who say they have returned a questionnaire even when they haven't, and the enumerators will have no way of knowing. Their job is to get a completed questionnaire for every housing unit on their list. We have sufficient staff to begin non-response follow-up on schedule in every census office in the country. We front-loaded our training selections, which means that our goal was to train and give assignments to twice as many people as we needed. That way, we'll have staff to offset attrition. We've also identified over 50,000 individuals for replacement training so we can keep replenishing the pool of available workers. We've retained this two-to-one redundancy at the vast majority of sites. And indeed, Mr. Chairman, across the national system, we are now at a three-to-one redundancy. That is, we have three times the number of enumerators already hired that we believe we need as our basic production uh, unit. So that simply means we are more people out there. It means we will have the opportunity to accelerate the completion uh, in, in as many LCOs as possible. Nevertheless, we continue to recruit in targeted areas even as we speak. This may mean, in fact will mean, that in the end, some qualified job applicants will not be hired. We realize they will be disappointed, and you're likely to hear from some of them, but we believe that we must keep the applicant pool active to assure we have sufficient staff to cover uh, higher rates than expected of attrition. Thus far, we've identified 2.6 million qualified applicants, our 108% of our goal. To place non-response follow-up in context, a Appendix 1 graphically depicts each of the major census uh, enumeration operations that precede and follow it, and that graph is reproduced up here if we want to refer to it. And on these operational issues, I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, may I then ask for a few more moments to, to address the question that you raised about um, uh, the politicization of the conversation about um, long and short form. Let me uh, first uh, bring to your attention what the, um, the, at the second of your graphs, um, it was the, the census report that you referred to. And just interpret that so you'll see what that, what that means. What that ESOC report of April 18th reported was that based on our non-response follow-up workload, the fact that we received at that time a more than 4% increase over our expected uh, mailback response rate is that we were now convinced that completing non-response follow-up on schedule was not at risk. That's all that meant. We didn't resolve any issue about the long and short form differential. It only meant that, uh, that in terms of our overall response, it's above the level that we believe we needed uh, to set. It says nothing about data quality, our completeness of the long form data. And that's what I've tried to bring to your attention on, on several occasions, that we may well have a data quality problem, but we simply don't, don't know that yet. So it's a little uh, disingenuous to suggest that we have already resolved the problem of the long and the short form. We, we don't know. We resolved the problem of non-response follow-up as best as we can at this stage. But let me then turn to the other um, uh, concerns that you expressed, and I, I, I appreciate the seriousness of them, and I'd like to take a moment or two to, to address them. Um, first, I do have to say that um, uh, perhaps it's an accident, or perhaps it's not an accident, uh, that nothing in your uh, prepared comments that you just read from quote me as calling into question the leadership of the Republican Party. There is no quote available to have put into these comments, because my comments have never addressed the role of the Republican leadership. Uh, and therefore, I, I, I have to express some concern that you have chosen to interpret my public comments as, as chastising or otherwise criticizing Republican leadership. If I have, then I ask you for that quote, whether it was in a press conference, whether it was any other kind of report to anyone else, whether it was in testimony. Uh, I don't believe such a quote exists. There may have been newspaper articles that have implied that, but that's not that I have said them, because I do not believe I've said that, sir. And I want to say what I have said publicly. What I've said is that public voices, national public voices, which certainly includes some of the leading members 
who have uh, control over the airwaves, uh, talk show host, 60 Minutes, have undermined, as far as I'm concerned, the seriousness and the importance of the census. And they did so during a key period. And whether that key period is the third week of the census or the fourth week of the census is not the issue that I was addressing. I was the addressing the moment at which this conversation began to, to occur publicly. Um, I have also said, and here I have referenced national political leaders, not just public voices. I have said that at a key moment in the census, approximately March 27th to April 2nd or 3rd, we had the full attention of the American people, the full attention of the American people on the census. This was a remarkable accomplishment. All of our, all of our information on exposure and awareness suggests that 97, 98, 98, 99 percent of the American people were aware of the census. I believe that that was a moment when we could have had an important conversation with the American public about the fact that democracy has to do with rights and responsibilities as well as uh, benefits. And I believe we missed that opportunity. I believe in that key week that what could have happened could have said, look, the census is part of the responsibility of belonging to this country. And that was not a good moment to talk about the census as a pick and choose uh, opportunity. Uh, or if you don't like it, don't worry about fully cooperating. That was not a good moment for those voices to be heard. My concern, and what I expressed in public shortly after that, was out of the disappointment of a bipartisan passed Senate resolution on the floor, which subsequently was removed in, in committee, and uh, I appreciate the efforts that went into removing that from the co committee, but the floor nevertheless, in a bipartisan vote, uh, said, well, the census after all is a, uh, could be thought of as a form of harassment. Uh, these enumerators knocking on your door, that it was uh, not something that should be mandatory, the reason that the census is mandatory, as I understand it, it's not a law I passed, the reason that the census is mandatory is to signal that it's a serious part of what it means to be part of this country. And here was a bipartisan pass Senate resolution that said, well, no, I guess we don't mean it after all. It's really not to be mandatory. So when I said publicly that I was disappointed in national political leaders. This was not a partisan statement. This was a very bipartisan statement. So I'd have to ask you, Mr. Chairman, if you want to say that I've partisan politicized the census, I need to hear from you the quote, the exact quote, either in a press conference, before a hearing, or in any other public setting, where I have blamed any Republican leader. And I don't believe you'll find that quote. Um, let me... Uh we have several quotes we'll give to you. I, you. I don't think maybe you use the word Republican, but you would say, for example, here was a moment when our national leadership could have explained. Well, I mean, I think you ref the inference is always to the Republicans. And when the articles come out in the paper, and we were just talking about earlier, they, you know, they come out a little different than maybe you uh, think they come out. But you talk about uh, a garbled message was sent from that uh, um, uh, widespread attack on the long form, uh, was, which was testimony before Congress. The uh, um, referring to uh, uh, here was a moment when our national leadership could have explained what the role of the serious information in our is in our economy and our society. That voice was either silent or was pandering to talk show hosts. Uh, that was before the Census Advisory Committee. Um, when you talk about the inner survey, the inference was that it was because of the remarks. The, the questionnaire showed it was a 10 percent, 10 percent. The remarks apparently were on March 30th and the survey showed it jumped 18 percent prior to March 30th, March 30th. And so, I mean, it, what happened was, uh, when I look at the, the data, is that when the forms got in the mail and people received them, that's when people had concerns about privacy. And was after that, and, and when the forms arrived, that's when the 18 percent arrived. Then there were some quotes of the comments by Mr. Lott and Mr. Uh, Governor Bush at that time. Um, but, it, but I think you have been repeating that blaming, um, uh, in effect, Republicans. Uh, for, you know, pandering to talk show hosts. I mean, I can't control, neither of us, none of us can talk, control talk show hosts. Um, they, they get under my skin, too. Uh, um, but, uh, uh, 
So, you know, here, there's articles in several papers. Here's one from the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. Some Republican leaders view the census as an invasion of privacy and urge Americans not to answer questions they consider too personal. That, quote, that pulled the entire response rate down for the country, Pruitt said Wednesday, quoted in the Fort Lauderdale paper. That was an incorrect quote. I did not say that. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm, I understand how the media, but the thing is, this is what's being reported time and again that, uh, um, that I mean, yeah, I, mean, I think you have already said that uh, if you don't want to fill out a question, at least give us enough information to use for, the, for apportionment purposes. I mean, so we, you know, we've, we've all said, you know, if you don't want to fill out one question, I use the illustration, my neighbor doesn't want to give her phone number and her income. That's, you know, fill out the rest, fill out everything you can. And you know I have, uh, you know, uh, been advocating getting everything, you know, complete the forms as best you can. And I, I know you've never, you know, accused me of anything. But um, um, let me um, switch to some questions now. Um, yesterday, the whole world seemed to come under attack from a major computer virus that paralyzed various public and private organizations. Were census 2000 operations affected in any way? Uh, that, have you, I don't know if you've seen I got some on my email of, yeah, I love you stuff. It was actually in the national news. It affected, obviously, lots of organizations. I, I'm just curious if it had any impact on the Census Bureau. Um, uh, no, we, we, we did a lot of work on our computers yesterday, at least in the headquarters. I don't know about all the regional offices. Uh, and we, I forget exactly how we did it, but somehow we put down a message through all of our computers, uh, a new kind of antivirus protection. Uh, and there may have been isolated instances where particular computers in the headquarters had, had read that message. But uh, there is certainly nothing of a large scale uh, to, to report at all. Yeah. Everything's okay. I mean, it's been reported that organizations around the Certainly. country and have had right. some real right. problems. It's a fair um, concern. As you know, we've discussed the Tampa office before, and I know and you responded to, with a letter to me this week. And I visited my local office in Bradenton. I met with the enumerators. Uh, Ms. Maloney talked about uh, an article in Boston. There was an article in the, my local Bradenton newspaper talking about a census worker working on the 1950 census. He's not working on it this year, but it was just an interesting human interest story. Uh, I had one lady come up to me one time and talk about she worked on the 1940 census. And so uh, it was a little different back then. Uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't use the mail system, uh, uh, response, uh, uh, certainly in 1940. Did they use it in 1950? Uh, when did mail come in? In 1960? 1960 was the first. 60, yeah. No. So, Par partial. Uh, it was a partial mail back in 1960. Yeah, but in the 50, they were going, you know, right. knocking door to door for everyone. But um, I'm not, and just, just my sense, and it's not anything to, uh, you know, yeah, it's more anecdotal. I, I'm, I think that my local office in Bradenton is doing a fine job. They've got a good director there, an assistant director of the local operations, and, uh, you know, things are, I think the hiring's going well. They've got some difficult areas to count, too. Um, but in Tampa, they apparently have had some problems. Do you rate um, local census offices as far as ABC, you know, whether some type of rating scale to identify those that are the problem ones, whether it's an ABCDEF type of scale or some type of scale to show that, you know, uh, and I don't want to say Tampa is in, in that sure. cat low category, but if it is, you, you can identify that. If you have, how many would be in that? Because we're talking about a national census, well, we can have all the hiring, as, we, as Ms. Maloney said, we've exceeded our rate by over 100 percent. But if in a local area you have a problem, I mean that's real. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, could oh you, no. Uh, how many local census offices would you consider being problem offices, and however you want to define census Certainly. problem? Certainly. Um, Fair enough, and I should say quickly that the definition of what is a problem local office uh, varies from operation to operation. Um, indeed, uh, in the Braden Tampa area, our mailback response rate was quite strong, uh, and yet we have some other areas where we had a lower mailback response rate than we had hoped. Um, our update leave, for example, in early operation, we may have an LCO which wasn't doing as well as we would have hoped in, in, in update leave. Uh, so the, the, the def so it's not like a single office through all operations is particularly weak. In the Tampa office, as I have written to you, um, we believe we had a serious management problem. And when you have a serious management problem exactly at the recruitment period, then that accumulates. So I would say across the country, uh, uh, well under 5% had the combination of those two things, management problem plus recruitment problem. And the only thing you can do at that moment is try to change the management quickly. And when we changed the Tampa management, our recruitment rate just shot up quickly. We are now feeling very comfortable about the, uh, the quality of the enumerator staff. I think Tampa, the, the press coverage in Tampa has been uh, reasonably uh, consistently negative. Uh, we believe we know why that is so. 
Uh, we do not think it's always about our operations. It's about some other things that are going on. We remain disappointed that the, uh, the person who has gone to the press so often, uh, who was an employee, uh, then had to be let go, has not yet signed the release, so we can't explain why he was let go. Uh, and that puts us at a somewhat disadvantage in this press, press battle. Um, but I would say, to, to specifically your question, not Tampa, but to your more general question, um, we, we, uh, we look at these data, of course, every day, uh, our recruitment data. And right now, um, we have about 16 offices, that's as of, of, of a day and a half ago, 16 offices which we're particularly concentrating on with respect to our, our, our recruitment uh, system. Now, th th that 16 by tomorrow could be down to eight. Uh, because what happens in some of these cases is that your, your, your payroll system is catching up with you. Our database is primarily our payroll system. We have two offices, for example, where we had the very happy occurrence of a lar large number of people shifted from update leave and other kinds of operations to enumerators. We were still paying them on the old payroll, so they weren't showing up. So it looked like we didn't have anyone there, but we were fully staffed. And it took two or three days to sort of move all of those records onto our, our NERFU payroll system. So complicated little things happen. But I would say that the total number of offices right now uh, about which we have any, any serious concern is, are in the handful. Now, tomorrow it may be a somewhat different set because we may have a higher attrition rate than we expected. Uh, at any given time, the probability of there being somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 10 to 15 offices uh, where we're focused on them is very high. Is recruitment the main way you measure Right now, quality? it's, it's right recruitment now. hiring. How many people showed up the training? Uh, thing. But see, next week it'll be attrition rates. Okay. Uh, if we have higher than anticipated attrition rates, that will be the thing we focus on. That's a question on the same range. I had town hall meetings in my district last week, and one in, in Sun City, which is the southern part of Hillsborough County where Tampa is. Um, and had some people talk about jobs. And I, you, you made, made this comment in your opening statement, but I think it'd be nice if you could elaborate on it again, that you're hiring more people than you need, and that some people are not going to get called, and yep. they may be qualified people. And, uh, you know, with the operation of this size, the communications is not as ideal as you would in a, you know, a, a, a regular operation. And so, um, letting people know why they're not getting this response, why they're get, not getting called and such. Could you just elaborate on that a minute? I think it'd be helpful for oh, people. Oh, certainly. No, I, I, it, is, it has been an issue throughout this entire uh, process. And, right, and other members of Congress are going to get this, these calls at their offices, yep. too. Um, we, you know, going back to your opening comment about expecting us to use every tool in our toolkit to make certain that we, we complete non-response follow-up at the highest level of accuracy possible means that for us, we do not want to take any chance of diminishing the recruitment pool until we're absolutely certain we don't need someone. And the recruitment pool is not just, as you say, a national number. It is also, it's got to be targeted. We're talking about bilingual uh, people. We're talking about people with cultural uh, understandings. We're talking about people who understand complicated situations in different parts of the country. So we've got to find exactly the right number of people. And then we're talking about mailback response rate. And we're talking about how many callbacks are we going to make? We, we may be in an LCO where they're going to be, uh, we're going to have to fully use all six callbacks. Other LCOs were the first couple of calls. We begin to get people because it's a high retirement area. Everyone's at home and so forth. Which means, from our point of view, the most important thing is to maintain that recruitment pool until we know we don't need it. So we're not calling people and saying, we don't think we're going to need you. Therefore, it, it makes no sense to do that until we're absolutely certain. Even after non-response follow-up, uh, if, if I could just direct your attention quickly, we have a very large operation called Coverage Improvement Follow-up, a SIFU operation, um, which has 7.5 million households in it. We need a very large field staff to do that task. Now, we're not so sure where that task is going to fall yet. That's our national estimate, but that will be concentrated in certain areas. We want a recruitment pool there. So all we can do is sort of I put it this way, we would rather suffer <laughs> the, um, the burden of some people who are disappointed that they weren't hired than not have enough people to finish the census. Good. And that's simply the position we have to take. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Maloney. Okay. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, Mr. Chairman, in your opening statement, uh, you made reference to a fax which uh, Representative Coburn provided to the press an illegal act if the Privacy Act applied to members of Congress, I might add. Uh, Dr. Pruitt, to try and put this uh, incident in perspective, 
the information inadvertently faxed to, to the wrong number was not, uh, as I understand it, Title 13 material, was it? That is correct. It was not Title 13 material. And we faxed you, no Title 13 material. Can you share with us what exactly is Title 13 material? Well, Title 13 material, of course, is any material which has any kind of census response, including a census address. And those, all of that material simply handled differently. Uh, the How is it handled differently? Um, well, it's... Um, after, after it's, it's, it's only handled by people who are sworn uh, to the Greek fully. No one can see, have any access to any sort of uh, confidential Title 13 material that hasn't been sworn as a census employee. Uh, when the actual forms come in, they are, are recorded in our local office, of course, again, by sworn people. They're then boxed, put into the highly secure FedEx system, and then they come to our headquarters. And then they're reopened, of course, in our headquarters, again, by sworn employees. Also, um, could you or do you have any idea how many faxes the Bureau sends out in one day from its 520 local offices, 12 regional offices, four data capture centers and headquarter offices uh, by the 500,000 people currently on the payroll? Do you have any sense of the proportion? Um, it's a very large number, <laughs> a very large number. Uh, and uh, we regret uh, any human error. Human error does occur. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, the woman who made the call immediately recognized that she had misdialed, immediately recognized that she had misdialed, and tried to actually track the source of that misdial. When we actually were able to reach the woman, we asked that this material be destroyed immediately, uh, and that was refused by the woman who received it. Instead, she chose to share it. We then called the congressman's office and asked him to destroy the material immediately, and he also suggested that he was not going to do that. So we are regretful that this piece of information got out. Um, I, look, I, I'm not trying to defend human error, uh, but I am very pleased insofar as errors have occurred, and they will continue to occur. Uh, thus far, there has been no Title 13 information which has uh, at all moved into any kind of public setting. The, the Bureau has now had some limited experience with the non-response follow-up, and do you have any reports of hostility, of slam doors, uh, and, and is any, what is the response like? Is it more hostile than 1990? Have you had any sense of a comparison? Or is it no, more friendly? What is the response? It's, it's, um, uh, we, we are, we're very pleased with the successful launch of non-response follow-up. That is, the training programs all occurred <laughs> on schedule, and as I say, we're fully, fully um, uh, staffed. That is, everyone, all the people, the number of people we needed came to all of our training sessions. Um, and we are now in the field. We only have three days of information, of course, but uh, approximately 8% of our non-response follow-up workload is already uh, completed in the field. Now, that still has to come to headquarters and be checked in and so forth, but from the field point of view, they've now finished slightly over 8% of the cases. Uh, that's as of, of last night. Uh, and that's, we're right on schedule with respect to that. We are certainly getting uh, reports of, 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 of concerns, I mean, slam doors and so forth. It's very anecdotal. I have no way of knowing whether it's larger or smaller than, than we got in 1990. Uh, the little factoid I learned yesterday is we've had 212 dog bites so far uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and one, one sort of serious bee sting. Uh, but I don't have the... I don't have the, uh, the base of that for 1990, whether that's a higher rate of dog bites uh, than 1990 <laughs> or not. But we worry about those kinds of things. Uh, we do know in Anchorage, uh, at least I read in the Anchorage press, insofar as we can trust the press on these kinds of things, um, at least four different enumerators um, in our update leave uh, operation uh, were met by people carrying guns uh, and asked them not so to come on threatened. the property. Really? And so they left. Uh, really? Of course. So, but again, that's anecdotal, and I, I don't have um, mm -hmm. I don't have a 90 base to know whether this is higher or lower than than uh, the 1990. Mm -hmm. Okay, of the 41 uh, million households in the non-response uh, follow-up universe, how many of them are long forms, and how many are short? Do you know? Oh, I'd have to do the arithmetic quickly. It should have been, of course, one out of six, exactly. But since the long form differential is 10 percent, um, someone will quickly do that arithmetic for me. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, the, the point is that there, I mean, obviously the point is that there are a higher percentage of long form yeah. cases so than, than we had the anticipated. Same proportion. Yeah. Okay. You, you stated in your uh, testimony on page two that you're concerned about potential loss of data 
due to opposition uh, to the long form. And you stated further in your testimony that you have no information on item by item uh, non-response. But uh, do you have a sense of which questions would cause the most problem if they weren't answered? Well, the most important information we have, Congressman Maloney, uh, is the 1990 uh, item non-response pattern. We think that's reasonably predictive of what we might get in, um, in, in 2000. And item non-response in 1990 varied from as little as 1.5 percent to, on the, on the income question, I believe the key income question was 14 percent. Uh, but I, I have that in front of me. I don't want to give you the wrong, the, uh, the wrong number. Um, so it will vary a lot. We think that's, that should be the most predictive. As I've said in, in Congressman uh, Rogers' hearing, uh, that's what we will be examining. Um, I don't, I don't, for this kind of work, I don't, uh, I don't believe, I don't not, I don't disbelieve in survey data, but I don't want to rely on survey data. If you actually look at the uh, inner survey um, question, when they ask the respondents which questions did they find to be intrusive, uh, they found a very high percentage of people saying, I, I think, for example, 22 percent said that they thought the race question was intrusive. On the other hand, in 1990, only 2 percent of the American public did not answer the race question. So uh, I, I, I simply don't think that the survey data are likely to be predictive of item non-response. And what is most predictive is probably the 1990 pattern. Regarding uh, the difference uh, in, in response rates for the long and short forms uh, from 1990 census and the 1988 census and the 1998 dress rehearsals, could you explain and ex expand on what those response rates were? Uh, yes. in, in um, in the 1990 dress rehearsal, the response rate, uh, the differential response rate across a couple of sites averaged about 6 percent, and the non-response, the differential in 1990 was 6 percent. Uh, in 19, in 2000, the differential response rate between long and short form was quite a bit higher. It varied between whether it was an update leave in Sacramento to South Carolina to Menominee and so forth. But I, I, it's, not a, it's not inaccurate to say that it would have summarized close to 12 percent. And of course, 12 percent is the non-response, is the differential in, in the 2000 um, pattern thus far. Okay. Also, what, what's your, your analysis of the roughly 12-point differential in the long and short form response rates? And, and what impact did it have on your planning for the 2000 census? I'm sorry, Congressman Maloney, would you repeat that? Yeah, there, was a, there was a differential um, of, of, rough, of roughly 12 points between the long and short form response rates and the 1998 dress rehearsal. And what impact did that have, if any, on your planning for the 2000 census? We did not, um, we did not treat the differential um, uh, in the dress rehearsal as predictive of what we would get in, um, in 2000. Uh, so we did not focus on that, on that differential um, as, a, as a likely clue as to what would happen in the census environment. Um, we simply, we use the dress rehearsal, of course, to test operations and not to try to predict the behavior of the entire American public because these are, these are sites. Uh, it's we basically don't know that operational. Uh, yeah, and, and we changed some operations, including, of course, the second mailing, based upon our dress rehearsal um, uh, experience. Um, I might say, if I could, uh, the uh, proximate rate of will in the in the non-response follow-up: 33 million short-form uh, and 9 million long-form uh, respondents. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Some of the long-form. Um, one thing I'm. You know, congratulate the Bureau for doing it. I think it was actually before you, both of us arrived on the scene here specifically was uh, seeking uh, professional expertise to help design the form. And in reflecting back on the 1990 form compared to this, I think I, I commend the Bureau for um, getting professional surveyor uh, consultants and helping do that. It, it is a, you know, I think that's positive. I have a question about the long form we're at. It. The Bureau is using one out of six uh, uh, for the long form, what is what criteria was used for that? Why did why we're using one out of six? What is the purpose of that? Well, the the, the real question is what level of geography uh, do you want to be able to provide reasonably uh, reliable estimates? And our uh, by doing one out of six, we can take our our statistical estimate down to the population of less than twenty thousand. So a community of less than twenty thousand, or any other kind of group of less than twenty thousand. Uh, that is, how many uh, uh, disabled veterans there are. 
uh, if that population is, is as large as 20,000, we would be able to give you a reliable, the country a reliable estimate of its characteristics. So that's really, you know, at, at a higher sample, if, if we did one out of two across the country, we could drive that 20,000 down to 12,000, or well, better get my experts to tell me exactly where. But, uh, uh, but that's the reason. We thought that was a prudent uh, uh, a way to help the country understand the, the social dynamics, the housing characteristics, population characteristics, and so forth. That, that and decision was, I guess, made before you're, both of us oh, yes, actually absolutely. involved in this. But uh, yes. uh, um, let me, since I brought up the issue of Colburn, I just want to briefly, I, you know, I know it was an accident, and you know, everybody regrets accidents. But it, uh, um, now my understanding, by the way, I don't, I, I don't you know, this, Mr. Colburn's office could tell this, but that the information was not uh, given to the press. Um, but for Title 13 data, I'm glad we have those standards, but privacy data is, you know, is, I guess there's a different standard for privacy data, which is individual social security numbers and things like that, that you don't have the same level of uh, security concerns for that. Is that what? Well, we have very high levels of security concerns, um, Mr. Chairman, for all of our data. We simply have different ways of processing non-Title 13 and Title 13 data. Uh, and we, we do use, you cannot, as I think Congressman Maloney's questions uh, implied, you cannot manage a census without using email, without using faxes, without using various forms of distributed information around, around to the d different actors who need it. Um, and therefore, to say that we would never use the fax system or an email system for our uh, administrative records would cripple the census enormously. So we do handle certain kinds of things differently from how we handle uh, Title 13 data. We have an enormously high standard for how we handle Title 13 data. And that doesn't mean we don't have privacy concerns and security concerns for any other privacy data. Um, indeed, I'm sure that's true in the U.S. Congress as well. Uh, but at a certain point, you do have to use the apparatus that's available in the society for communication, um, and faxes happen to be one of them, and faxes are subject to the human error of misdialing a number. Let me ask a question about quality control issues. In, uh, you know, we've had the one computer error where the pre-notification letters had the extra digit. We had the, um, the uh, surname issue uh, problem where for, uh, uh, for certain residential areas, units. Um, and as we get into this, I, mean, I want to see how the quality control efforts, that we have a confidence that they're doing the right job, and especially as we go into this non-response follow-up. And would you discuss quality control issues and specifically quality control for the enumerators? I mean, how do we know, for example, that an enumerator who is assigned to go out and call in these 20 houses doesn't go home and fill out 20 forms and bring sure. them back to you? And just, I think we need to have assurances as there has been in the past, uh, there are quality control checks. And because we've had some quality control failures, that you know, we're, we're going to hopefully avoid these in the future. Well, these are quite separate kinds of uh, quality control procedures, of course, our right. quality control on our software system. I, I would like to put in context the, um, the, the, the digit error that so much has been discussed. And we, of course, brought that to your attention immediately. Uh, we have uh, now produced operations that rest on about 2,500 different uh, uh, software uh, programs, uh, and uh, I, I can't promise you that there won't be other errors, but I can tell you that um, all of the operations to date, uh, using about 2,500 different software programs, are now completed uh, and on schedule, on budget, and correctly. And if in that huge amount we did have a digit problem with respect to a contractor. It happened. We tried to explain how that happened and so forth. Uh, and then the second one that I brought to your attention with respect to the surname, which has a very, very tiny operational implication, but nevertheless, I wanted you to know about that. Uh, you do have to see that as one out of 2,500. And the fact that uh, all the rest of them have functioned um, as we had hoped for them is to us a very good sign. Now, the, the second issue that you raised, the issue of quality control assurances with respect to enumerator work, certainly the Census Bureau has been preoccupied throughout its history of, 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 of fabricated responses by enumerators. So we put in place uh, uh, quality checks. And uh, the work of every enumerator is double checked. That is, we either send someone back out or we have the, uh, use a phone system to go back into the field and check on a proportion of every enumerator's work on a re regular basis. And if we find any enumerators have reported to us a case, we go back out and find out that that was a, uh, a fraudulently provided case, all of that enumerator's work is redone, all of it. And that, of course, the enumerator is fired immediately. 
Uh, if you want the actual rate uh, at which we do that checking, I can, Mar Marvin Raines can explain that better than I can. Okay. Would you like to hear that? Please, Marvin. Um, I think. Five percent of the workload. Yeah. Yeah, it's five percent of the workload of every enumerator. And how frequently are we doing that on a constant basis? That's whenever they bring the work in, we. No. So every workload that comes in from enumerator, five percent of this pulled out as a sample, we go back and do a quality check, and and so that's just happening every day across the system. Let me ask a question about Social Security numbers and just clarify what the bureau's position is on that, um, so that if yeah, because we also want to be cautioning people Surely. that there are going to be people out there that are going to fake being census yes. takers, and, but one of the questions you're not asking. Yes. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that, uh, Mr. Chairman, because there are scam artists out there who are trying to get Social Security numbers, our bank card numbers, our all kinds of, of, of numbers calling themselves census employees. Um, and would you, once again, by the way, describe what identification the Census Bureau employee would have so when they're out there, what, how you, you know, they know they're not getting the scam yes. artists. Right. Let's do that first and then talk okay. if we can about the Social Security. Um, every enumerator, of course, has a badge. Every enumerator is also carrying a what we call a tote bag, which has the uh, logo on it. But uh, and here is here is the badge, um, and um, every um, enumerator also has his or her kind of address file book, uh, which is a uh, eight and a half by eleven fourteen. Oh, it's bigger than that. Sorry. Uh, uh, it's not a kind of thing to be easy to fabricate, and has their their work materials. Most importantly, every enumerator. Uh, is uh, expected to have immediately available the phone number of the local office. So a respondent can say, when you knock on the door, you say, I'm from the Census Bureau, and they say, I don't know if you're from the Census Bureau. And you say, look, here's the phone number, go call the local office, and here's my name, here's my ID, and then you can double check. Most importantly, uh, no enumerator should ever ask to come in the home. And most people who are scamming, especially people who are trying to conduct a, an act of thievery, need to get into the home. Uh, and therefore, if anyone asks to come in the home, we're telling the American public, that's an alert to you that that's not a census taker. That doesn't mean you can't invite them in. Of course, the numerators get invited in and serve tea and, and cookies uh, and so forth and so on. It's all very nice, but that sometimes it doesn't happen that way, but it does happen in some occasions. Um, but nevertheless, no one should ever ask to go in the home. That's extremely important. Um, now, we, there will nevertheless be scam artists out there uh, trying to get information from a, from a, from a household of, of a sort that can be used against them. Um, the Social Security issue, um, during the mail-out phase, uh, approximately 21,000 households got a special letter from me, uh, uh, four different versions of that letter, uh, saying that uh, this is the census and for various complicated reasons, we're going to be asking your social security number. And there are four different treatments in that 21,000, depending upon the experimental design. Um, and we made it quite clear this was voluntary, this was not a mandatory, this was not part of the census itself, but we were asking that question. The reason that we did that experiment in the context of the census environment is because we're under strong injunction from the U.S. Congress uh, and indeed, you referenced it again in your opening comments, to investigate to what extent we could use administrative records more efficiently than, than we're doing in 2000. The Congressional Monitoring Board had a full hearing on Congressional on administrative records. Um, part of the administrative record system of this country, of course, is Social Security numbers. So we were doing that as a way to test the privacy concerns. And we'll report, of course, our evaluation of that experiment as soon as that's been completed. That won't be until sometime uh, next year. So in those cases, we actually ask in the census environment for a Social Security number for roughly 21,000 households, making reference to the fact that, in addition, we actually ask for the Social Security number in our, uh, our, our um, uh, Survey on Income and Program Participation, our SIP survey, and that's in order to actually strengthen the survey instrument. Uh, and because we are under Title 13 allowed to cooperate with other agencies and strengthen the database by, by uh, sharing records. What's the sample size of that? Sample size of SIP is, is 300,000. Actually, and, we, and would, but correct me if I'm wrong that none of the uh, yeah, I'm sorry. response uh, enumerators yeah. will ask Social Security no, numbers. No, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. That's the okay. key part of your question. During non-response follow-up, no enumerator has any reason ever to ask for a Social Security number. 
uh, because the experimental work we did was only in terms of mail back response rates. Would it affect mail back response rates? And it was never intended to be part of non-response follow-up. So you're absolutely correct. No enumerator has any reason to ever ask for a social security number of, of, of anyone in, in the society. Let me ask, I think, one final question. It's the, it's the hard to enumerate areas in those areas. Does the Bureau, does each local census office have a written plan for dealing with the hard to count neighborhoods? I mean, everyone's different. I know you, you told Ms. Maloney's district, one of the hardest ones to count is very different from my hard to count ones. My hard to count areas are migrant areas in the center, uh, more of a center part of the state, actually outside of my, even my congressional district. Do, do local offices have specific plans to address their specific problems, which are different from the affluent high-rises in uh, Manhattan. But Surely. No, you're quite right mm -hmm. that hard to count uh, a gated community can be as hard right. to count as a migrant worker uh, right. a, a community. Um, and, and yes, sir, every, um, every LCO does have its hard to count uh, 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 strategy. Uh, this is part of the record because we, we, put, um, we put this material into as an appendix uh, into to my written testimony. Um, and it does indeed take into those kinds of things. Language is spoken. Uh, uh, distance the enumerator has to travel is this very remote, things like gated communities, uh, things so like high office primers. would have a little different plan. E exactly. Okay. The, the, there's a whole list of the, of the traits, but they weight very differently office to office. Okay. And so, so it's, not a, it's not a cookie cutter operation. In oversight res uh, part of it, we can have access to when we visit a local office to see what oh, oh, they're absolutely. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, one <sighs> comment on, on the hard to count, and that's Indian reservations. Um, would you comment uh, an update on what's happening on the Indian reservations uh, uh, in particular? Well, let me start, if I can, with uh, remote Alaska, because the, the number is, is clearest in my mind, because uh, I just talked to the people up there who completed that. Um, we are now completed with remote Alaska, and every village in which the local leadership, which is a vast majority of them, cooperated with the census, we did 100 percent count. Uh, and we're very pleased with, with that work thus far. And that's, that's a part of our uh, Native American Indian population, the Native, American, Native Alaskan population. Um, I think with respect to um, uh, Indian land more generally, um, overall the pattern has been very strong, very positive. Uh, there are two or three pockets, and I will have to ask uh, Marvin Raines to comment on, on detail on that. There are two or three pockets where we're still getting some resistance. Uh, and I think there's one in Montana, as I recall. Um, but this is not a general problem. Indeed, the mailback response rate uh, from some of the Indian areas uh, beat their plus five goal. Uh, about as many of those did as across the country. The total was 17% of the communities across the country meet the plus, plus five goal, which is an extraordinary accomplishment by those, those communities. Does anyone know offhand the, the proportion of those who are Indian areas? You once looked at that data, though. Let me just get that information. Yeah, as, as yeah we know, certainly give it to you. The, you know, the, the uh, American Indians were one of the most undercounted populations we had in 1990 uh, census. I was curious about it. Ms. Maloney. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on, on administrative records, uh, Dr. Pruitt, can you uh, use administrative records without Social Security numbers? Well, uh, or do you need Social Security numbers? It, it's, in principle, there are there certainly are social security numbers. Uh, other, excuse me, there are administrative records. For example, school attendance records, uh, 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 perhaps occupancy records from a local government, uh, which would not necessarily require you use a social security number. That would be very uneven across the country. And when we looked at administrative records, one of the things that we um, found it very difficult to, to implement was anything that was standard across the country, because different jurisdictions keep even the same kind of records, i.e. school attendance records, our um, uh, um, uh, housing occupancy records, our housing start records, all kinds of other records are different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So it's very difficult to design a census in a way that standardizes quality across the entire United States. The only things which are standardized across the United States are largely federal programs. Such uh, as? Such as Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and, and those programs all do use, so I think all of them use social security numbers as part of their data record. I, I, I might say, if I could just take another word or two on this, um, Mr. Chairman, you asked what was the Census Bureau's position on a social security number. We have no position. Uh, indeed, um, 
given, given the concerns about privacy in this country, uh, we have never recommended, and I don't think we would ever recommend this country have a national identification number system. Uh, the census is done in, uh, in Scandinavian countries, for example, based on a national identification number system. Uh, my own judgment would be that that would not be a direction that, uh, that either the U.S. Congress or the Census Bureau should, uh, should move toward. Um, now, there's a very complicated issue, because if you don't have a national identification system, and yet we're under pressure to use administrative records in order to keep costs down and improve uh, coverage, uh, what is the nature of the administrative records that we can use which, come, which stop short of what the American public could interpret as a national identification number, which was to say a social security number? Uh, so it's a very tough question that the Congress will have to discuss as we start planning for 2010. We did think we had an obligation to the Congress to sort of try to learn what we could in the census environment. It's very difficult to learn some of these things outside of the census environment. That's why we conducted the experiment. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's not a policy position of the Bureau to recommend that we use administrative records in, that, uh, in, in, in the way that would in necessarily incorporate Social Security numbers as part of it. Well, the chairman has repeatedly mentioned that he uh, would like to see administrative records used more, but that really basically raises a privacy concern because part of administrative records, the reliable ones, Medicare, Medicaid, which you mentioned nationally, all involve a Social Security number, which is a privacy concern. So there is a privacy concern directly related to administrative records. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, clearly. Certainly at the national level, there would be. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad that the Chairman Miller clarified that Congressman Coburn did not give uh, census information to the press. But uh, based on, on his strong statements on privacy, it would be important, I think, to have the same privacy level for members of Congress as other agencies, such as the, as the uh, Census Bureau. And I think something that we could work on in a bipartisan way is a bill that would cover Congress under the Privacy Act and have that uh, go through Congress so that uh, Congress people were held to the same privacy standard, because privacy is very important. That could be something we could work on. I would certainly support it. All I can say, Dr. Pruitt, is uh, congratulations. Uh, I'd like to publicly thank you and all of the professionals and part-time workers, full-time workers in the Census Bureau. You have reversed uh, three decades of decline, and I have no further questions at this point. I just congratulate you and wish you well during this you. difficult enumeration stage and just uh, really hope that everyone will cooperate with the enumerators and help us get the most accurate count in America. Thank you very much. Um, and in conclusion, let me say thank you. I, it's, it's satisfying at this stage because of the mail response, and now we're in, as you know, uh, um, one of the most difficult parts of it. And things are looking good. I'll be looking forward to progress reports as we go through this process. Um, we'll have little bumps along the way, we all know. And you're, you're going to have an employee that's not going to be one that's going to live up to the standards of the Bureau, and that's going to be an embarrassment, but we need to uh, uh, prepare for that, too. So on behalf of the subcommittee, thank you for the job you're doing, and thank you for being here today. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record without objection, so ordered. In case there are additional questions that members may have for our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent for the record to remain open for two weeks for members to submit questions for the record and that the witnesses uh, submit written answers as soon as practicable without objection, so ordered. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.
This weekend on America and the Courts, Justice John Paul Stevens and Solicitor General Seth Waxman appear before members of the 7th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. That's tomorrow 